So the thing we think about most is the Guggenheim Museum. Um, but the thing we probably don't think about too much uh, is what started this whole thing. The museum did not start the revolution. So that's interesting. So um, the museum itself might be the poster child of Bilbao, Spain. But uh, Bilbao, the thing that transformed the city is not the museum. The museum came at the very end. The first thing that happened that resulted in the transformation of Bilbao is, was political, that there was a regional power sharing, that uh, the constitution of Spain was changed, and it allowed this province to <coughs> exercise a certain degree of political autonomy. So they increased their ability to uh, retain tax dollars and to spend those tax dollars the way they wanted. They completely, uh, they suddenly gained political autonomy. They could uh, control things in this province that had previously been imposed upon them from the central government. And so historians who look at Bilbao, who have already looked at Bilbao and will continue to look at Bilbao for the next hundred years, they, they will, the story they tell will not have much of anything to do with Frank Gehry's beautiful museum. It will have everything to do with that initial act that triggered it, which was a political reform. There was autonomy of the province. Without the autonomy of the province, the increase of, of power at, in local hands, nothing would have happened. Bilbao would have continued to decline and decline and decline, People would have left Bilbao, would have been left just a lot of old people who didn't want to leave. Every college student, every college graduate, if they went to school in Bilbao, upon graduation would move to someplace else, somewhere else in the European Union. Um, and Bilbao's population would have declined and declined and declined, and it's, the, it's a familiar story. But in uh, seeing that that was going to happen, and having the sudden opportunity of political autonomy, they mobilized, uh, they did a remarkable thing. They, um, the government said, listen, we're the government, we can do a lot of things, but we can't do everything. And we can't do it well enough to transform this province or this city. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm glad you can, uh, we can get together on this. My name, is Robert Cowher. My background is I'm an architect, uh, but I also did extensive research and uh, professional work as a planner. I have a PhD from MIT. Uh, I specialize in history and theory of architecture and urbanism, and my specialty is cities in the developing world. Uh, most of my field experience and research is in Asia. Uh, but I've also uh, branched out, and I'm now looking increasingly at Latin America. Um, one particularly formative experience I had, which is the reason I'm teaching um, uh, that I appear before you, is after the tsunami, remember, you probably don't remember any earthquakes, but your earthquake. But before your earthquake, there was an earthquake in uh, the Indian Ocean. And uh, in 2004, around Christmas time, and um, that earthquake, which was 9.1 or 9.3 on the Richter scale, the third largest earthquake in recorded human history, uh, the earthquake wasn't so bad in Asia because um, uh, in Asia, uh, the part of Asia in Sumatra where I was working, uh, there's not a lot of concrete construction. There's not a lot of masonry construction. There's not a lot of high-rise construction. And in, in Sumatra, wherever there was high-rise construction, they put 
the right kind and enough steel in the concrete buildings so that even with a 9.1 Richter scale earthquake, most of their buildings uh, stood up. Stood up. <clears throat> the earthquake wasn't the problem so much. The problem was that the way the earthquake happened, it wasn't a point, it was a, a line. And so two plates went like this, a plate lifted up and, and then dropped. And when it dropped, a lot of water uh, just went whoosh. And if it had been at one place, it would have propagated out in a circle. If it had moved in a circle, the further away you get from the earthquake, the waves would have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller because the, the rays would have been spreading up. But it wasn't a point, it was a line. So it went whoosh, and so it just kept going. And the, the, the forces weren't spreading out, they weren't radiating, they were going straight like this. And so the energy in that wave didn't spread out. It hit full force on the north coast of Sumatra, uh, where I worked with several villages. The tip, uh, this series of villages, uh, more than a dozen villages right along the coast, uh, the, the typical survival rate was 15%. Uh, and the only survivors were men between the ages of 15 and 55. Uh, because they were the ones who could swim, and they were the ones out in the fishing boats where the uh, wave was rather small. It was only uh, the physics of this you'll appreciate is when the ocean floor comes up and meets the surface that the force of that, uh, the energy in that shock wave through the water was concentrated in a smaller and smaller amount of water so the wave got bigger and bigger. And so some of the waves were reported at over 30 meters high. Um, and it just, it basically scraped the surface of the earth um, so that nothing, nothing was left that wasn't embedded in the ground. Um, and so um, an interesting conversation that we got into on Tuesday with the group that was here um, was how um, the typical response of the international community was an unprecedented uh, amount of money and consultants and uh, international organizations uh, coming to Sumatra and wanting to help. But they had a severe handicap. Their, the biggest handicap was not the lack of local expertise, lack of translators, lack of housing, tons of that. The problem wasn't uh, lack of need, lots of need. 200,000 people, 200,000 houses were lost. Uh, and so there was a lot of construction that was needed. Um, there was a lot of mental illness, a lot of uh, physical illness resulting from this event. Uh, the biggest handicap they faced was that each of these organizations had a set of rules. And the rules said, you can't just go there and give people money. You can't just go and satisfy people's needs. You have to pre-qualify every recipient and before you give them a penny, you have to fill out this form, you have to make sure it all makes sense, we have, to, we have to protect, we have a charter and bylaws and lawyers, and we have to make sure that this money is well spent how we define it. And so, if it takes just as much money to help an individual, if it takes just as much effort and paperwork to help one person, as it does to help, uh, you know, to build a whole, a whole new city, and it's better to do the big projects than the little projects. Um, but even the big projects, the money doesn't, as you know, who gets the money? Right. So I have I have a million dollars, and I'm a big donor, and I'm going to give it to Haiti to help in the uh, recovery. Where does that million dollars actually go? Back, back to you. Back to you. It cycles back into the system. And as uh, your colleagues taught me on Tuesday, <clears throat> it's something like 50, 40 percent, did you say? 40 to 50 percent yeah. goes back to yeah. the donor. No, it goes back. 
Fifty percent at least goes back, yeah. and then the money that does reach the the intended country yeah. doesn't make it to the people. No. It gets the real beneficiary. So the end beneficiaries, you know, there's very little left. And so what we did in Sumatra is um, uh, I partnered with a local organization. Uh, the people in that organization were from the city of Banda Aceh in Sumatra. They were friends of mine. And what we did uh, is we said, um, we're just going to collect money from individuals around the world, word of mouth, <clears throat> no big advertising, and it's not a lot of money. We're going to collect donations from individuals around the world, and we're going to give it to individuals uh, in Sumatra. So it was from person to person. There was no international organization, there was no government agency, there was no local consultant. I paid for my plane ticket, I stayed with my friends, I paid for my meals, I didn't get a penny of it. As a matter of fact, I donated a lot of my own money to when I met the orphans that were left without parents, you know, what do you do? You have to, so there was no overhead. Uh, the money went from people we contacted in other parts of the world, and it went to the people in the uh, destination country. It was a very personal connection, and it worked quite well. And the main thing we did is, one of the main things we did, was we helped them rebuild their villages. And the way we did that was through land readjustment. And so we learned the technique of land pooling, land readjustment, uh, on Tuesday. And if you're interested in that, your friends are all experts on that now. And you can ask them what that is. Um, but that's the main thing we did. And we did it uh, not by hiring, well, we did hire people. But who did we hire? We hired the survivors. We hired the young men who would otherwise, who before we hired them, were sitting in refugee camps uh, sobbing because they had lost their parents, they had lost their wives, they had lost their children, they had lost everyone. Um, just their fishing buddies and themselves, that was all that was left. And so steady, instead of just sitting in the refugee camp getting bitten by mosquitoes because there was an outbreak of mosquitoes, it was a very complex thing, we put them to work and we mapped every village and then we did the land, re the land pooling <coughs> reassembly of parcels so they could start to rebuild. Uh, another illustration of the problems faced with rebuilding is um, I met with a group of engineers from the United States, from Germany, from Australia, and these engineers, you'll understand their, and I understand their, their position. Their position was, we cannot allow people to rebuild their own houses, because they will do it wrong. Because houses in, in Sumatra typically um, steel reinforced concrete frame houses with brick infill. Mm -hmm. You've heard of that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and so the engineers said, uh, we can't allow them, we have, to, we have to get the police force out and the building officials out to make sure no one rebuilds their house. And uh, me and my friends said, well, how do you justify that? There's 200,000 houses that were lost. We lost a lot of population. We don't need to replace it with 200,000 houses. But we're going to have to build a lot of houses. What do you propose? And their answer was, we don't know, but you can't allow people to rebuild their houses. They will do it wrong. They don't know how to do it. They need the experts. So what we did in response is we created a comic book. A comic book. Uh, in the local language that showed people how to build a proper foundation, how to how do you know the right the, the cement to sand to water uh, mixture is the right proportions, how do you do slump testing, how do you make sure there's enough steel, how do you make sure the steel is the right steel, and so we we spread the information like this is all stuff you guys know right? Yeah, we have. And you have all that. Yeah. 
Did you do a comic book? Yeah. I'm glad to hear that. A lot of flyers. <coughs> a lot of flyers yeah. taught people how to do that? Yeah. I'm so glad to hear that. <coughs> the group last year didn't seem to think but that But it came out true. this year. Because Did it work? It, no, it the Swiss. Last year. The one what, the one from uh, Real Change. Real Change? Real. I didn't see one. My okay. company, my company was involved in publishing that. Yeah. That's fantastic. If there's any yeah. way I can get uh, more information on that, oh, you, yeah. you, wanna, yeah. you can download it. It's okay. Yeah. Where is it? Uh, I'll show it to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. No okay. So, um, and so on Tuesday we got into the discussion of how to do things. Uh, uh, in a, using a diff, using different models, we talked about slum clearance. We looked at a bidonville. Uh, what was the name of the bidonville? Jalousie. Uh, Jalousie. So we looked at bidonville Jalousie, and we looked at some options for how uh, to create better infrastructure. And specifically, we looked at um, you know the obvious approach that's been used for 60 years is you destroy the housing and rebuild new, better housing. Um, uh, but we looked at a, a more intermediate solution that would selectively uh, place smaller, uh, just not really quite, not proper roads, but a wide enough uh, space for something other than a motorbike to get to different locations so that water supply, transportation, to and from schools and jobs and church and social opportunities could be supplied. Yes. What, what do you think um, about this uh, uh, Medellin? Medellin. Colombia? Medellin, uh, Colombia. The element the, the, they, they put is, uh, is uh, what's that? Community, community traffic? Yeah, just to reduce the, the, the distance. Yes. Or the the cable, fire. The yeah. cable car. Yeah, it's very. So we, uh, the shape of this, of this uh, area is very similar to Dalhousie. Yes. What, what do you think about this uh, um, intervention? Is it uh, is it by nature? Do you think? Well, um, well, this is my answer to that. Is uh, do you think it's feasible? <laughs> uh, uh, I, what, who, what, I, I don't know. I'm just I. Any one of you, someday you'll be at the front, and I'll be asking you that question. Yeah, this is your job. Um, but I'll be showing you maybe that example because that's kind of the big uh, best practice currently. Uh, the question of whether it translates to Haiti or not, uh, the short answer is no, it doesn't translate. Uh, unless you work really hard to get it to translate, it might translate. But um, it's a very different situation. They have drug lords and crime and murder, and you have something else. You have a different situation. Yes. So um, you have similar problems, but they're different problems. Yes? One thing. Yesterday you talked about, one, to, uh, to make the slums better by pooling. Yes. Okay. And prepare extensions for, for the slums. Yes, extensions. Okay. Isn't preparing extensions uh, going to encourage people to come to Absolutely, yes. I know. This is the problem, and this is the key point. Well, let me, let's focus on that. So after we looked at land pooling and the possibility of sharing the hardship, so you don't just displace every family out of the way, everybody shares in that hardship and everybody gets their house rebuilt but on a smaller piece of land. Um, that's much, much easier than bulldozing the entire place and building proper formal housing with proper land title and proper building codes and all of that. It's much easier to do land pooling, but land pooling is not easy. It's expensive and it's hard and it's difficult and uh, there's, a there's a lot of political friction. And as soon as you go through that process, uh, it becomes crystal clear that an even better approach is to prepare locations to install the infrastructure before people move in, or as the first people start to invade the land illegally. Um, what do you do now when people start to invade the land illegally? But, but shouldn't the government have a different policy? I mean, to, to 
um, ensure that people don't go and build in these places? Well, that's the thing. The government, if the government's choosing the location, where's the government going to locate the new settlements? Uh, we don't know, but they should find a place not in that same neighborhood. Well, we do know because we've done it. The place the government will choose to build the extension is uh, a place where the land is available and it's affordable and it, you can build the infrastructure. So where is that land? It's too far away. <laughs> the reason that land is available is because all the farmers left it to live in, to move into the beet field. It's too far away. So at some point, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard because... Is that my computer? No. no. Okay. The, uh, it's hard because we, government officials, we government officials have been trained from third grade onward to, you know, we have to have order, we have to, yeah. have, we have to do things properly. And uh, at a certain point, the aspiration of perfection, the insistence on doing things properly, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. In a way to insist, if you insist on doing things the old way, you're, gonna, you're basically condemning generation after generation to continue doing things the exact same way they've been doing. The problem, in a way, the uh, especially since this economic crisis and the earthquake and all the things that are happening in the world, the idea that the world will become more and more and more like the United States in the 1960s, um, that's not going to happen. Increasingly it looks like that's not going to happen. And we looked at the population statistics. When you were born, there were 4 billion people in the world. Now there are 7 billion people in the world. 30 years from now, there will be 10 billion people in the world. Uh, and most of them will live, most of them will be moving to the bidonville of the emerging economies throughout the world, of the global south. That's the reality. And as soon as you face up to that reality, and as soon as you look at the history of development policies, and you realize that very, very few governments have ever been able <coughs> to supply formal housing to, that keeps pace with uh, the demand. As a matter of fact, I can only think of one example. Uh, we know now it pays to not just be an idealistic uh, development expert. It pays to also be idealistic, but also to be a historian. You look, you, you figure out what is the best way to do something, and then you look at the history uh, honestly. Be honest with yourselves. What is the history of this approach? And what are the lessons available to us from that history? And one lesson is, if you do everything right, like we're taught in engineering school, you might succeed. You just might succeed. And they did. They did an amazing thing. And they're trying to teach China how to do it. It's not so easy to translate. We're talking about translating from Medellin to Port-au-Prince. It's not so easy. Yeah. Here's a prior translation from Singapore to China. Not so easy. Um, even though Singapore had an authoritarian government, they can, their, their population was willing to be dictated to. They said, please tell us what to do, O oh, great leaders. And the great leaders told them what to do, and they did it, and it worked. China, similar, a dictator, an authoritarian government system, um, telling the people how to do things, high degree of control, but it's not working. It doesn't scale up very well. So um, by looking at history and looking at what worked and didn't work, we can tell that as we go from 7 billion people to 10 billion, and if we, and we go from... One billion people living in slums, one to one and a half billion people living in slums today, to 30 years from now, to have twice that many people living in slums. Two to three billion people in the world will be living in slums. The Bidonville and Port-au-Prince are not going to get smaller. The government, no offense, 
no matter how good you are, and no matter how good the government is, I bet that there is no way the government is going to keep up with the demand uh, of population pressures and economic development pressures in port au -Prince. And um, increasingly, economists are telling us something that is crazy. We know that slums are the problem. We look, all you have to do is look at them. There's no sanitation, uh, the, the opportunities, the joblessness rate, the criminal activity. Slums are the big problem, and we should just wipe them out and rebuild them. But then what did I hear the other day? Some fancy pants economist from Harvard University, he gets on the TV and he says something that is crazy. He says, when you look at the slums, Yes, are there, are there problems? Yes, there are problems. But when you look at the slums, this is not the result of failure. This is the result of success. When you look at the slums, what you should see is people with the freedom to choose economic opportunities that are much better than the ones they left in the farmland and the smaller towns and villages. They moved to, to the city for economic opportunities these are the dynamic, creative entrepreneurs of the future. This is the new middle class. They're going to come out of the hardworking immigrants that come and live in the Bidonville. Um, it's crazy, right? It's yeah. obviously crazy. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But, but there's something. something it's, you know, instead of, if, if nothing changes uh, in your minds, um, except to see the slums as something more complicated than just a problem to be pushed away. Um, that's, that's already a step in the right direction. A lot of people around the world are now looking at the history, honestly, of slum clearance, and they're saying, you know, let's stop banging our heads against the wall. We've got trillions of dollars of debt, and the things have gotten worse, not better. So, um, and Albert Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So maybe this crazy, these crazy economists from the, the, the universities around the world are, are saying, are onto something. Maybe we can um, nurture the creative talents and energies of people struggling to survive in the Beatonville and uh, help them reduce the problems of crime and uh, sanitation and access. And, and that's kind of what we're going to look at in Medellin, Colombia. So um, we're going to quickly move through um, the mythology around Bilbao, because that came up. Uh, and we're going to quickly look at Singapore, and then we're going to focus a bit on Medellin. Okay? And a few other uh, cities in uh, Latin America. So that's, you're all caught up with. Hold on to them for uh, a few minutes. We'll go through these examples, and I suspect your questions are not going to be answered, but the challenges will get even more amplified. But on the other side of that discussion, which is going to go on way beyond today in this classroom, um, there might be some new solutions that have not entered into the, the menu of possibilities yet. So the idea here is, you know, right now, most people like yourselves are looking at a very small menu of possibilities. Let's see, we can do slum clearance, we can do nothing and let it, let it go on, or we can do, well, I don't know, there's not much else we can do. So the whole point of this is to look at history, very recent history, as in a few months ago, uh, in the case of Medellin, and make a bigger menu of possibilities uh, and see if they can be trans. Some of them, some aspects of some of these solutions just might find a home, uh, might open up a possibility or two uh, in your experience. So the first one that came up on Tuesday was Bill Bao. Everybody knows about Bill Bao because everybody um, has seen um, this before. Right? Yeah. 
It's an amazing thing, and this is my favorite shot because it shows a 19th century historic urban fabric of an industrial city. It's very familiar to, to people who live in cities all over the world. And then you have this stunning and startling new form that is like, what happened? Did a spaceship land? I'm going to go check it out and see what's there. And you also have this landscape that has always been there. And so you have the 19th century city cent uh, centered and embedded in this glorious landscape, and then something new and exciting. So this picture kind of captures it. And in the foreground, you have clear signs of economic activity. Um, and so it's a very enticing portrayal. And here's a similar shot. Um, but um, as I was saying before, uh, we expanded was the thing we know, the thing that everybody knows about Bill Bow is that Frank Gehry flew in his 747 airplane, landed there, and said, crumpled up a piece of paper and said, build this, and then he flew away, and uh, the people were happy. That's the story we know. Bill Bow became a center of international tourism, and Frank Gehry is like the second coming of Christ and he saved everything. Right? <laughs> um, well, if you, live, if you lived here and you lived through this, if you were a government official uh, in Bilbao since the 1970s, you would have experienced it very differently. Frank Gehry's museum is the tiny little beautiful shiny red cherry on the top of a mountain of other stuff that it was a lot of hard work and big uh, things. And it wasn't all about flashy design. Uh, and where we left off was the first thing that happened was uh, political. It was completely political. The province where Bilbao is was controlled very with an iron fist from the, from the capital in Madrid, Spain. And at a certain point, because of electoral politics and the dynamics and the shifting seats in the parliament, they gained, suddenly they gained a huge degree of, of control over their own futures. And so they changed the tax code, and they suddenly had the ability to tax, uh, to, to gain tax revenue and decide how to spend it. And uh, they basically gained autonomy and they became uh, more like a separate country. They had a certain power, amount of control that allowed them to make big plans. And the first thing they did with this new power is they said, um, they said government is the most important institution for, making, for saving this city. Because what was happening at the time, uh, and it was very predictable and very clear because many, many cities had gone through this, it was a booming industrial port in the late 19th and early 20th century. It was a powerhouse of industrial production, but uh, the port became uh, uh, silted in, and economic activity moved to other ports uh, in Spain, and they lost their industrial capacity. Uh, the factories closed, people were thrown into, out of work, they had unemployment, they had crime, they had degradation, they had the young people moving away. The population of the city is going down, 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 down. Have you ever heard, you've seen that, right? You know what that's like. So that's happened in many cities in the United States as well. Uh, and so they had to do something dramatic. And so the government uh, identified themselves as the most important player, but they also came up with a second idea, which is, we are incapable of doing this alone. We don't have the financing, we don't have the vision, we don't have the risk-taking capacity that it's going to take to save this city. Because if we do something uh, you know, small, it won't change anything. We have to do something big. And so they partnered with the private sector, and they developed what at the time was becoming extremely popular in cities all over the world, which is a public-private partnership approach. And so through this, pub, this joining of, of, of the government and private uh, firms, they formed a coalition where the government would plan it, 
and turn it over in stages to the private sector to finance it and build it. And the first thing they did was not the Bilbao Guggenheim Museum. That came at the very end. That's the cherry on the top. The first thing they did is they rebuilt the port, they rebuilt the factory infrastructure, they attracted industrial activities, they attracted new uh, third, uh, tertiary sector, uh, information age uh, industries, and they transformed the university system so that they could train the young people to take those jobs. And one of the biggest things they did was they, um, they connected everything together uh, through uh, a mass transit system that was state-of-the-art and very, very efficient. And so all of a sudden, uh, it became much, much easier to connect all these different populations and opportunities together, uh, which is a theme that runs through uh, the story of Bilbao, Singapore, and Medellin. Um, if left to its own devices, the private sector would say, we invite you, the consumers, to purchase motorbikes, and when you can afford it and you're fed up with all the motorbike traffic, we invite you to purchase your own automobiles. And taken to its logical conclusion, you get horrible congested mess, and it's faster to walk where you're going. Uh, if you, but you can't walk where you're going because the cars will, will run over you. Um, and that's happened in city after city after city. Um, and it's happened with the help, the generous support and aid of the Japanese International Cooperation Agency. Thank you very much, Japan. Um, because Japan said, when it was developing after World War II, Japan said, uh, America said, hey, let's, sorry about the bomb thing. We'll help you rebuild. And we know how to build cities. You build cities like we do. First thing you need is you need a freeway through your cities and connecting your cities. And the Japanese, uh, once they woke up, they said, oh, thank you very much. No, thank you. Uh, you, in your great wisdom, United States of America, have built this great system, and no offense, but the United States is not Japan. The United States has an endless continent of resources, of wealth, of space, of land, of openness, and uh, the individual little cowboys of your citizens, they like to have their own uh, cars so they can go wherever they want, whenever they want. But we, the Japanese, our island is very small. It's very mountainous. Uh, we have very little land with which to secure our food needs of the nation. We need food security, and so we can't sprawl like you did in the United States. We need to maintain our forests, our mountains, and our farmland. We need to keep our cities compact. We will build trains. And so they built trains like nobody had ever built trains before in the world. And now they have the most amazing train system anyone's ever seen. And they push people on the trains. The trains come every 30 seconds. It's, it's a remarkable choreography. Um, but what, is, what else is Japan known for? Japan is known for its automobile industry. Who's buying all those cars? Okay. The US. The US is buying those cars. Who else is buying those cars? Well, the, Japanese, the, the automakers said, hey, Japanese government, what about us? What are we, chopped liver? We need some support. Why don't you let us, why don't you build some roads so we, can, so we can sell some cars? And the Japanese government said, okay, we will, just not in Japan. We will build roads everywhere else, but not in Japan. So Japan has one of the lowest automobile ownership rates in the world. And they're f as given their level of economic development. And so where did they go first? Let me ask it a different way. What country is most well known for the biggest traffic jams ever in human history? China. China now, but before China, Bangkok. Bangkok, Thailand. So Thailand was the first beneficiary of Japanese foreign aid. They built lots of roads. The Thai people said, thank you very much. You saved us. We're now on our way to becoming a developed country. Uh, if only we could get across town. 
So businessmen would get in their cars with their phones and their fax machines and their portable toilets, and they'd head for the meeting. And halfway there, they'd call and say, I know, I've been in the car three hours, and I'm not, I'm not going to make it. And so they turn around and go back. And so they never get to their meeting. Mm. Um, and recently, the Japanese have said, what you need is you need a high, uh, heavy rail system. And so the Bangkok people, the Thailand, Thailand said, yes, we do need a heavy rail system because our traffic is horrible. And so the Japanese said, let us help you. And so the Japanese helped them build this amazing heavy rail system that is the envy of the rest of the world. Uh, it's just too expensive for most people. So, um, and so, you know, so there's a food chain effect. And Thailand is, has a huge national debt. Uh, they can't really do anything more. And so the Japanese have now set up offices all over the world. And they are now in the process of helping anyone interested in, because it's not fair that people in the developed world have personal freedom of automobility. It's not fair that they're the only ones. So we want to spread the benefits of freedom of mobility to everyone in the world. And so we want to help those people build urban freeways and a freeway system. And so that's, that's a, uh, how they sell the idea of, of, of spreading roads to other places. Well, in Bilbao, they said, um, no, thank you. They, do, they had built um, some roads outside of town, but inside of town, not so much. It's very, very limited. And inside of town, they said, let's do it with mass transit. And so they built a beautiful mass transit system. It has heavy rail. It has light rail. It has buses. It has bus rapid transit. It has um, many, many different levels of transportation that provides an alternative to automobiles. Because automobiles will never go away. Automobiles are fantastic, but it's if a city, if, if automobiles are the only choice for a city, it doesn't work because it just takes up too much space. It's a very simple geometry problem. It just takes up too much space. So, um, so that thing that, so this is really the story of what eventually led to the museum, is they restructured their political organization. They gained the power to develop and uh, change the infrastructure to develop their industries, to promote job growth, to promote education, to promote uh, mobility at a very low cost, to improve housing, yes. And uh, then at the tail end, at the very end of that, the cherry on top was Bilbao, was the museum. 99% of the investment was not for tourism. 99% of the investment was for the people of Bilbao. And um, we talked about Disneyland versus New York City. We talked about how the number one top tourist attractions in the world are places like New York City and Paris. And the reason those cities are so popular is because those are places where uh, the people enjoy living there. Uh, People who think that the way to attract tourists is to build a resort just for tourists, and you build a wall around it and keep the locals out, you keep them away from the benefits, that's a problem. Uh, it's, and it's, it's very expensive, and you don't get the return on investment that you would get if you make life better for everyone. Is this museum just for tourists? No, it's also for the local people. Um, so that's very, very important. So any questions about Bill Bao? OK. So even if you are going to learn a lesson from Bill Bao, it's important to learn the right lessons. It's important to understand how important it is to invest in the local infrastructure of life, not just in the cherry that, that gets you on the cover of the travel magazine. Yes. Right, so you're saying it's hard, and it takes political will. Yes. I don't know. Sometimes it takes a crisis. Which brings us to Singapore. Um, 
Let's go to Singapore. So an interesting thing happened in 1965. Do you know the story of how Singapore became a country? Well, Singapore used to be part of Malaysia. It was a British colony, and then it gained independence after World War II. And in 1965, the government of Malaysia said, oh, Singapore, our, our biggest city in the entire country. Singapore, Singapore. So many slums. So many problems of sanitation and population. There's no farmland. There's no water supply. It's a parasite that's sucking everything out of the country, and it's an impossible. No one's ever going to solve the problem of Singapore. So what should we do? What's the solution to Singapore? Do you know what they did? They, they uh, kicked it out. You can kick out a... I don't, I don't want you to t get any ideas, okay? Don't, don't kick Port-au-Prince out of the... Don't kick Cité du Soleil out of, the, out of the country. I mean, maybe you could cut it off and float it out, right? So here we go. We're traveling across the world. We're going to Singapore. Let's get rid of some of these annoying things. It's going pretty slow, but here it is. We're heading into Singapore. So that's exactly what uh, happened. Malaysia kicked Singapore out of the country. Uh, the, the minister, the, the, the senator from Singapore, who is the representative of Singapore in the Malaysian parliament, he went on, national tele went on television, tears streaming from his eyes, and he announced, we have just been kicked out of Malaysia. I mean, imagine. And uh, his name was Lee Kuan Yew. He was an extremely well-educated man, um, a visionary. He became uh, the president of Singapore. And, um, and a dictator. And he basically said this. He said, listen, we have no water supply. We have no military. We have no food supply. We have slums. We have unemployment. We have crime. We can't house our people. We can't feed our people. Um, Malaysia kicked us out because they expected uh, us to starve to death. And by kicking us out, they basically said, you starve to death over there in your own corner. Don't pull us down with you. If you're going to start killing each other and eating each other, uh, we don't want to know about it. And you know, stay on that side of the water, because um, this is an, Singapore is an island. It's an island. And so, um, so what they were facing was a crisis of uh, unprecedented proportions. As a matter of fact, you've heard of Calcutta, right? Yeah. yeah. I have a friend who, in the 1960s, uh, went to Calcutta. And it was horrible, right? Calcutta in the 1960s, people were dying and starving and killing each other. And then he went to Singapore, and he said it was worse than Calcutta. And so that was the kind of thing. So Lee Kuan Yew um, said, we have a crisis, people. And he said, let's get to work. And, and so he, pulled, he got everyone to pull together. And he now... Um, he's still alive, and his son is a minister, and his son was president. But they basically, the first thing they did was they, um, they did massive slum clearance, yes, because that's what you did back then. And he built uh, public housing. And so any, every place you look in Singapore, you see uh, massive public housing developments. There's the presidential palace. Um, See over here. So most of most of what you're seeing are public housing developments, and um, everything that Corbusier said um, was taken to heart. And so a lot of what was built was very much directly influenced by Corbusier's ideas. 
So you have um, high-rise towers and slab buildings. Um, that's the campus. And uh, you also have uh, one of the best mass transit systems in the world. And basically what they did was they made a very sophisticated train system that connected all parts of the island. Um, and they crossed at the downtown area. And then wherever there was a station, they put um, the highest density of, of housing. So they made it so any, it's because it was an island, they made it so anyone living anywhere could get where they need to go in about a half hour to an hour. And so, um, and then they, they built a, a, a state-of-the-art port and they, um, they basically, uh, it's, it was the miracle of Singapore that they um, became extremely wealthy as an import-export center during the colonial times, and they returned to that. And so in downtown Singapore now, um, is now uh, the envy of cities around the world. Um, what they did to do this was they would get a team of their most educated people, send them on a trip to Europe or the United States to see what the best uh, practices were, and then they came back to Singapore and translated it so that it could work in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And so that was the approach in everything they did. And um, including some historic preservation of the old parts of the city. Um, but economic development, and more recently, the development of the arts uh, and uh, uh, educational institutions, um, they've, they've become competitors with Silicon Valley. They attract uh, some of the top biotechnical um, firms and research uh, in the world to Singapore. And one of the key things uh, and this was true not just in Singapore, but also in Hong Kong, was that people could get around and people had good housing that did not uh, cost a lot. So the housing was not open to market forces. The housing was owned by the government. And the rents of that housing was controlled to be about one quarter of the income of the residents. And the Singaporean government required everyone to save 60% of their income. So every company gave 40% of the salary to the workers and directly put 60% of their salary into a savings account in their name uh, that they couldn't touch until it was time for them to retire or to go to school or to buy a house. So it, uh, you know, I can't imagine this would translate, it would not translate to the United States, I bet it wouldn't translate to Haiti, but in the face of crisis, when they were going to starve uh, to death, they said, okay, we're desperate, we got to do something, and they, they, made, they made, they rebuilt the island, and they uh, structured the forced savings, uh, uh, public housing where the rents were capped and that was the key to uh, becoming a very attractive place to do business because if you're a company and you know that your workers are going to be able to get to work they're not going to get caught in traffic jams and you know that your workers have good housing that they can afford they're not going to be asking you for raises and raises and raises because the price of housing keeps going up because it's driven by capitalism uh, it wasn't driven by capitalism, it was public housing, and uh, it wasn't market forces. They took control of that, and it actually became one of the most, and continues to be one of the most attractive places in the world to do business. Uh, it's a tiny island, it now has four million people, and it's a model of good governance. But it's good governance at a cost. Uh, people do not have the same degrees of freedom uh, that other people do in other parts of the world, although that is coming in little by little. And um, 
many people are confident that even Singapore will feel like a very modern, open, free speech type of place to live uh, very soon. So that's the quick story of Singapore. Any questions about Singapore? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to talk about Made in Colombia. Uh, apparently, you've heard of Made in Colombia, and the first word that comes to mind is Pablo. drugs. Pablo, who? Pablo Escobar. <laughs> and um, Pablo Escobar uh, is just one of the figures responsible um, for the murder rate. Um, The murder rate in, uh, I don't know what the murder rate in Port-au-Prince is, but the murder rate in Colombia, in Medellin, Colombia, in 1992, reached a peak of 381 murders per 100,000 population. I don't, do you know what it is for Haiti, for Port-au-Prince? No. But it's... It's not even close to that, I guarantee no, it. No, um, no, no, no. Right, it's a very different thing. But um, the, um, I want to get the right slides. Let me find this. So, uh, Medellin, in Colombia had, um, Let's see. Made in Colombia um, in 1992 had the highest murder rate of any human uh, city in history. Uh, more people were being murdered there every year than any other place ever before. And, um, uh, and so that's what made Made in Colombia uh, very famous. Uh, recently. Before that, Medellin, uh, Medellin is a lot like Singapore in that it is very, very isolated. Uh, if you want to go from this valley of Medellin to the capital of Colombia, which is Bogota, it would take uh, like 20 hours in a car. The roads, it's through the mountains, it's very difficult to get there. Um, and so the only way really to get to the capital for most people has always been flying, which basically is another way of saying that you don't go to the capital. And so, um, so how do we get here? Let me try to control this. There we go. Okay. And so this is the country of Colombia. It has a coastline on the Atlantic Ocean, on the Caribbean, and on the Pacific Ocean. Uh, so it's a very interesting place, and it's a very unique place for plants and animals, uh, and it's a very mountainous region, and Medellin is uh, right in the center, um, and it's very, very isolated. Uh, but because of uh, the location of a uh, power source uh, based on water power, it became basically self-sufficient in energy, and the low cost of electricity made it a very attractive location for industry. So uh, after World War II in the 1940s, 1950s, uh, it became a favorite location of industrial production. And so it grew and developed very quickly uh, and uh, became very prosperous. It was, a, it was one of the wealthiest cities in all of Latin America. And um, here you see the skyline uh, as of 1970. Um, but what happened after this point, uh, it was so successful that it became an attractive location for people who were, as you know, uh, when a farmer has a piece of land and it's for him and his wife and his eight children, what does the next child, what, what does the next generation do? The farmer, uh, the, the farmland is divided into eight, and then each of those eight uh, has a farm, and then they have eight children, and they divide that in eight. So what happens? It's not an, so. Yeah, you know the story. So people move to the city. That's what happened, and 
these hillsides, um, people started to invade the land and make bidonville, basically. And so the bidonville, the slums, started to fill, fill the hillsides. And you'll see later, all of these slopes are now entirely bidonville, the slums. And this is um, the, from the original city where you can see the grid. It expanded up the hills up into every little nook and cranny of the surrounding slopes. This is uh, a map showing um, the informal settlements in the dark colors um, and the risk of death. And so it was the poorest neighborhoods where the highest risk of death was. So the slums, the slums became a very important place for the drug cartels. They could, uh, the young men could either earn 20 cents a day doing honest work, or they could earn, or they could work for the drug lords and become soldiers in the drug wars. So each cartel was at war with the other cartels. And uh, the people, the citizens were held in a state of terror. Um, and so the, the, um, the slums became the location of the recruiting ground of the drug armies, and it became the location of the drug activities uh, and the recruiting ground. And the people who lived here were afraid to leave their homes. Uh, it was not safe. And even when they were inside their homes, there was so much uh, warfare between the drug cartels that bullets would come flying through the plywood walls and it would kill people even if you were hiding in your house. And so it was an extremely dangerous area. Um, and so um, in the 1990s, uh, it reached its peak. And the military of Colombia uh, got a lot of aid from the United States and other places, the war on drugs. And the military started to get tough. And they started to get rid of the corruption. And so the military started to gain ground. Um, if you've heard of what's happened in terms of Medellin, it could be a lot like Bilbao. There is a lot of beautiful architecture. Uh, there are a lot of photographs of beautiful architecture in Medellin, Colombia. And so we could make the mistake of thinking, Frank Gehry flew in on his airplane and saved the people of Bilbao and flew away. And Beautiful architecture swooped into Medellin and saved Medellin and then flew away. But that is not what happened. Is there beautiful architecture in Medellin? Yes. Did it help? Yes. But did it do it alone? Not even close. The biggest thing that happened in Medellin, just like in Bilbao, the biggest thing that happened in Bilbao was political autonomy. The biggest thing that happened in Medellin is the military of Colombia started to win the war against the drug cartels. And so the drug cartels had to make a deal. They said, uh, we will leave the cities. We will move out to the countryside. You give us the countryside, we'll leave the cities alone. And so that was the deal that the drug cartels made. They had to make it because they started to lose the war against the military. The military was no longer corrupt. And they couldn't, uh, they couldn't afford to buy off the military anymore. And so the drug cartels had to leave the cities. So the first thing that started to happen is the murder rate started to drop in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, and in cities all over Colombia, the murder rate started to drop. The other thing that happened is the drug armies uh, in the countryside, they didn't have as much fighting to do. And so, and they continued to lose to the military. And so what started to happen uh, in 2002, 2003, 2004, is the drug armies started to demobilize. And so the young men who joined the drug wars when they were in third grade or fourth grade, they weren't taught math, they weren't taught how to read or write, they were given an AK-47, and they were taught how to shoot. And uh, 20 years later, 
they are coming home. They're coming home to Medellin. They're 30 years old now. They're in their 30s. They still don't know how to do math. They still don't know how to read. They still don't know how to write. But in their duffel bag, wrapped up in their clothes, is this AK-47. And they sure know how to shoot that thing. They're really good at that. They have always made a living shooting. And now they're coming home to Medellin. And they have no job skills. So what are they going to do? They're going to use their, the tool of their trade. They're going to do what they know how to do really well. And they're going to make whatever living they can with that AK-47. Um, at the same time, Medellin, Colombia, was an extremely corrupt government. I don't know if you know anything about corrupt governments. No. <laughs> but, what? So, it's sad, but we do. OK, so maybe you'll understand the situation here. Uh, it's still a very wealthy city. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things, a lot of businesses, a lot of money changes hands. Taxes are collected or not collected, but money changes hands. Um, but it's not nearly as good a place to live as it should be. It's extremely wealthy, but it's a horrible place to live. That's not right. And the people of Medellin were getting angrier and angrier and angrier. Finally, a, name, uh, a man by the name of Sergio Fajardo, um, who is a math mathematician. He got a PhD in mathematics at the University of Wisconsin, went to school at Harvard University across the river. And he came back from the United States, and he started a radio talk show. And so everybody started to hear what he was saying. And he was saying, listen, it's easy. Uh, you have to show the people that you're serious. You can't just tell the people you're going to stop corruption. You can't just tell the people you're going to invest in the people. You have to show them. Uh, if you just tell them uh, you're just the, the next and the last 20 politicians who, told, who said the right thing but didn't show anything. Uh, and you might be smart and you might have good intentions, but until you prove to the people that you're serious, don't bother. Just stay in bed. Sleep in. Don't bother. And so he, he, someone said, hey, you should run for mayor. And so reluctantly, he'd never held any office before. He ran for mayor. And he said, if you elect me to mayor, I will bring in a new team. And we will do something that's never happened before. We will not steal any of your money. It's your money, and we're not going to steal it. We're not going to steal a penny. So he won a landslide election. He brought in his people. And all of a sudden, they had $700 million in their pockets, not in their pockets, but on the table, $700 million from tax money that they were not stealing. And they said, OK, what, do, what are we going to do? We have four years. We have all these guys. Every day, the bus unloads, and there's guys with duffel bags, and the duffel bags are this long. And every day, there's another 30, 40, 50, 100 guys getting off the bus, showing up. What are we going to do? And so this is what he did. He said, we need these guys. They're going to make a choice. We're not going to put handcuffs on them when they get off the bus. They're important. They're the they're opportunists, right? These guys are going to do whatever it takes. They're entrepreneurs. They're creative individuals. They're going to do whatever it takes and whatever they can do. We have to give them an alternative to crime. We have to give them something that looks better, more attractive, where they can make money without killing people. And so they said, what's going to do this? We have to do education, job growth, small business, uh, training and opportunities for new businesses and new small businesses. And so they set up these neighborhood centers to teach job skills to everyone who wanted it. And they were targeting the young men between 20 and 40 uh, who were getting off the bus. And the tuition they charged was you had to give them your rifle. So you show up with your rifle and you give them the rifle, and they give you a certificate, and that's your, now you get an education. And so they did this, and uh, they also did a bunch of other things. 
But the main thing they did, the first thing, it's so important, it's not just the architecture. It was the drug war. And secondly, it was the education and job development and business development. The architecture comes later. The architecture is more than just the cherry on the top in this case. The architecture is the third thing. The architecture is the demonstration that this is real. We're not kidding. We're serious. And that's what the architecture does. So Sergio Fajardo's father is one of the most famous architects of Medellin. And so Sergio Fajardo grew up as a boy uh, understanding what architects do, knowing architects. And there was a group of architects that started in the 1980s with these big ideas. The ideas that these architects and planners had was, you, uh, we need a better mass transit system. Does that sound familiar? We need job growth. We need industry. We need uh, public facilities. We need all the things that people uh, will make people satisfied and happy and feel safe. We need safety. And we can do that uh, not just by putting more police you know, and making, making it more brutal, but, but transforming the neighborhoods. So we need to get these efforts into the neighborhoods. We need to transform the neighborhoods. And we need to connect the neighborhoods. So this is a slide of a heavy rail system. Maybe the Japanese funded this. I don't know. But it's, it, it, the first thing the Japanese wanted to do was a road system. And to their credit, they said, no, 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 no. But we'll take that second thing. We're going to jump to phase two, what you did in Bangkok. We want that. We want a heavy rail system. And we want to connect the rail system through a secondary system of buses. And because uh, it's a, such a hilly city, we want to connect it with trams. And so um, the first plan that developed in the 90s was to connect the wealthy neighborhoods with trams to the subway. They were building a subway system, and they were going to build tramways to the wealthy neighborhoods. Um, but then something happened. Uh, Sergio Fajardo became the mayor, and he said, listen, change of plan. All these trams that we were going to build in the wealthy neighborhoods, I know uh, every place in the world what you do is you develop infrastructure and you give it to the richest people uh, because they're rich. I, I don't know. I don't know why we get, just give things to the rich people, but that's the way we do things. That's the way the world works, right? Well, Sergio Fajardo and his team had a bigger job. They didn't have to convince the rich people of Medellin to not shoot each other. They had to convince the majority of people of Medellin not to shoot each other. And so they moved the tram. They took the tram that had been designed for the wealthy people, and they moved it to the poor people. As a matter of fact, they took a map, and they put pins in it Wherever a dead body was found, they put a pin in the map. And then they stood back from the map, and they blurred their eyes, and they located the densest population of pins. And the biggest place of pins was, was uh, let's see, where was it? Was right in here. It was right in this neighborhood of Santo Domingo. And so that's where all the pins were. So they said, we're going to do new schools. We're going to do uh, business training. We're going to do uh, libraries and public facilities. And the first one is going to be in the place where the most misery, the most bodies were found. And so that's what they did. They didn't do it for the richest people first, and then, and then uh, as they start to go to the less rich people, and then finally someday, oops, we're out of money. Sorry, poor people. You understand. We don't have any money for you. you. You understand, right? Well, they turned that around. I don't know what they were thinking. It's crazy. No one has ever done this before. Um, so they built, there's the, tra there's the subway station, and here's the tram. And it, it goes up to the area very high up on the hills where the most bodies were being found. 
And so now, all of a sudden, the people are connected to the rest of the city. They have job opportunities. They have social opportunities. They can get to church. They can visit their relatives. Uh, they can go to the other museums that they were building. Uh, and part of this, notice how they changed the housing. So, so the, 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 the Ministry of Housing said, OK, let's get some foreign funding in here, and let's fix the housing. Because everyone knows that you can't help people unless you bulldoze their house and give them a new house. That's, everyone knows that. But Fajardo and his team said, oh, uh, how about this? You give us the money as if we were going to bulldoze the houses, and then we won't bulldoze the houses. Because we're talking to the people. And the people are telling us, house, my house is fine. I like my house. What do you, what's wrong with my house? You're insulting me. My house is great. Uh, sure, it needs some things. I'd like to put a second floor. I'd like to, but keep, you know, I'm going to keep my house, thank you. I see what happens in other countries when you bulldoze their houses. We never get our houses. Someone else gets our, our land. So they decided, let's keep the houses, but let's give people the things they need more than houses. They need connection. They need connection to the rest of the city, which translates into economic, social, uh, and cultural opportunities. And so um, wherever this is the top where the tram station is, and they did have to move some houses, but they, they built high-rise towers, as was raised on Tuesday. They built a few high-rise towers so the people who had houses here uh, could stay in the neighborhood. So uh, my wife is near her sister-in-law and her mother. Uh, we don't have to move to the other side of town. We still have the social connections of our, of our community. And they built public space. The biggest single thing that was missing in these neighborhoods was space for public urban amenities. And so they built parks, and they put events in the parks. They, um, they put clinics, all the things we listed here. They put schools. Uh, they put sports facilities. Um, they put uh, museums. This is downtown. Uh, and this is the typical scene where people are gathering. So this is the area of Santo Domingo that they cleared. Uh, this is where, this is the place where all the bodies were. Um, more bodies were piling up here than any place else in Medellin. So they said, okay, let's start here. The people who they moved out were already trying to leave because it was too dangerous. The bullets were flying through their walls. Um, and so they took that location. They cleared it. Here's the, the top of the station. They had an international design competition uh, for the design of a new thing that they called a library park. It's not just a park. It's not just a library. It's a library set in a park. But uh, we know what a library is, right? That's a place for books. Well, what they mean by the library park is not just a place for books. It's uh, basically uh, in a very extensive, complex community center. So the business training programs were located here. The classrooms for, the for a lot of the adult education are here. Uh, internet connections, cultural activities, health clinics, uh, job training, uh, it was all located in the center. And it was a, um, a, a, a very different thing. It looks like uh, Bilbao. It looks like the Guggenheim Museum. But Guggenheim Museum is right downtown. Uh, and it's for the rich people. Uh, it's for the rich people. It seems to be it's for the rich people because it costs money to get in. And it's for international tourists. But this isn't for international tourists. If it's for international tourists, um, they would have put it downtown. If it was for the wealthy people in Medellin, they would have put it in the wealthy neighborhood. But when they put this in the, in the poorest, most crime-ridden neighborhood in Medellin, they sent a message. They said, they sent a message. They've been saying for months and years during the campaign, Sergio Fajardo was saying, I want to make Medellin the most educated city in Colombia. And uh, the response, because these people are not stupid, uh, mostly was, sure, let's see you try. 
blah, 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 more talk. It's all talk. So uh, he had four years. He had four years, and so he hit the ground running. He worked really hard. He built this library park in the first year and a half. So this is Sergio Fajardo. He never wears a suit, always wears blue jeans. When I met him in Harvard Square, I thought he was just a graduate student. I'd never seen a picture. He's young and handsome, and he's just a regular guy. Um, and uh, here he is. And when he was campaigning, he didn't go around in a car with bulletproof glass and police cars all around him. He walked. Um, and there's a long tradition of this in Latin America, Bogota, Curitiba. Um, you may have heard of, have you heard of Curitiba, Brazil, and what they've done there? Um, that's, that, that really, this is the end of the story. The beginning of the story was really Curitiba, Brazil, where they invented bus rapid transit. And then it goes to Bogota, Colombia, where Enrique Peñolosa was mayor, and he said no to the Japanese. He took their money, and he made the best bus rapid transit system in the world. And now he goes around the world telling people how great bus rapid transit is and uh, don't buy the Japanese story of the freeways. Uh, and then after Bogota, it's Medellin, uh, which is the most dramatic story yet. And so this is Sergio Fajardo in the streets of Medellin after the transformation. Uh, here you see the murder rate going from 381 in 1991, declining quickly, and then dropping even further after Sergio Fajardo became mayor. Um, and this is the murder rate in the other cities of Colombia. This is the murder rate of Medellin. So every city in Colombia has enjoyed some benefits from the military mobilization against the drug cartels. Medellin, which was in the worst situation, had the greatest benefit and it held on to it. And it's in part because of these programs of Sergio Fajardo. Part of it is uh, education for the children, like in Caracas, Venezuela, La Sistema, the, the uh, classical music education, um, the, the cable car. The space under the cable car becomes an urban plaza. What is that? This is Medellin? This is, we're back in Medellin now. Oh, okay. um, and so this is the, the, uh, the slums. These are the slums of Medellin. Um, the houses... The people, the improvement to the houses are because the people improved the houses. The government did not do anything. Yeah, because their economic situation got better, right? Well, also, the incentive to invest in their houses increased because they got the message, oh, they're serious. They actually are going to do something. They are going to change things. Uh, all of a sudden, the government has credibility uh, beyond what was thought possible previously. And Sergio Fajardo at Wentworth uh, in 2009, telling us this story. We got him to come here. He brought his architects and planners. Uh, the second play, this was his only his second speaking tour in the United States, and we got him here. Um, here's the library uh, up on the hill. It's not just uh, what happens inside there. It's a symbol. It says... You people who live in the slums, you're important too. And it gives them dignity that they did not have previously. And it gives them a reason to believe that life can be better for their children. So, so it's easy to think that this is a top-down thing, that the government officials said, we're going to fix this, and zoom, they did it. Um, but what happens when the government decides on its own to do things and they impose things on the neighborhoods and the population? Sometimes the people say, um, this isn't mine. This doesn't belong to me. This is yours. You put it in my neighborhood. I don't associate myself with this thing. So they didn't do that. They very quickly mobilized neighborhood organizations, and they started to have meetings. And they said they had children draw pictures. They had their parents describe life five years from now when it's better. And they took those visions, and they very skillfully put it together and established criteria that uh, was, um, was their, their criteria for success and failure. And so as they went through this process, 
the, the description of the project that they gave the architects came directly from the feedback from the local community. And so the local community was starting to feel a sense of ownership. But uh, always local communities are skeptical. They say, okay, we'll go along with you, we'll go along with you, but when are you going to stick your knife in my gut? You know, when are you going to steal this from me? Um, and so the government's job was to never allow that to happen. It had to feel like it was part of the uh, neighborhood from start to finish. Because what happens when the government comes in and does something and then goes away? What happens to that project? It doesn't get like... Um... It's in the hands of the community. And if they resent it, they will tear it down. They will burn it down. They will cover it with graffiti. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. They will not contain right? it. And so, but what happens if they feel like it's theirs? They will protect it. They will protect it. And the people are protecting this. Um, architecturally, I don't like it so much. It's this big sealed box. But even bad architecture does the job because it sends the message, you matter, it's, you have dignity. And that seems to be the crucial ingredient in this, is human dignity. This could have been done in a way as a top-down project that removed human dignity from the population, from the neighborhood. The, it would look the same. It would be the same library. It would look the same, at least. But it would have been imposed from the top down. And it would have given the message, you are poor. You are losers. You are failures. We are going to give this to you as a gift. But that's not how they did it. It's the same building, but they did it this way. They, they asked the people, and they were sincere when they asked the people. Uh, they said, what do you, what's your biggest fear? What's your biggest need? What do your children need to succeed and be healthy and safe and happy? And the people were constantly looking in the eyes of the government officials, seeing when they were going to start lying to them and, and start pulling back. Uh, and so the government officials knew that they were being looked in the eye by these people. And they could not uh, lie to them, even for a second, or else this would fail. Because we've seen that. We've studied history. We've seen it happens all the time. No matter how great the thing is that we give to people, they don't appreciate it. And they slap us in the hand. They slap, they bite the hand that feeds them, those ingrateful people. But they wanted it to turn out differently here. The government officials wanted it, needed it to turn out differently. From Sergio Fajardo down to the people on the ground, they needed this to turn out differently. So at every step, they said, the government officials were checking in with the community and saying, you mean like this? And then they do something else and they say, you mean like this? Before they built it, and the people would say, no, 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 like this. And they would correct, mm -hmm. they would correct what the government officials were interpreting, and they would correct what the planners, and they would correct what the architects, these big fancy people with with big college degrees and all their technical training, uh, they were taking, they were treating these, the local neighborhood residents as the client, as if they were millionaires. Because this is an expensive project, you can imagine. How do you build something like this on a cliff in the middle of the informal settlements? It's expensive. And the children of the local residents come here every day, all day long. And a group of us went to visit. And we went through here. And I don't know, have you been to Italy in the hill towns? Who's been to the? It's beautiful. I went for my honeymoon. And I realized that the hill towns of Italy are slums. They got better. There's, there's slums that got older. There's slums that matured. It's a bidonville that is 400 years old. And when a bidonville becomes 400 years old, it gets beautiful, and it gets nice. This is where the people didn't want to go outside. But here we are, um, having beer. Are we in the hill towns of Italy? Are we in the hills of France? Are we in Switzerland? No, we're in Medellin, Colombia. 
were sitting on the street right next to where all the bodies were. If we had been there uh, 15 years earlier, we would have lasted all about 23 seconds before we were shot dead and our cameras were taken from us. So they built botanical gardens. Some of the most gorgeous architecture you've ever seen. But it's not for the wealthy people, it's for the people. And they, they hired one of the most famous uh, artists, the internationally acclaimed artists of Latin America, to build sculptures for the downtown promenade, parks. Uh, street life returned. The New York Times did a story um, that called this, uh, it, it declared it the, 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 the hottest tourist attraction in Latin America because of all these things. These things that were built for the poorest people of the city uh, is also the greatest attraction for foreign tourists. This is like the Museum of Science in Boston. Have you been to the Museum of Science while you're here? Yes. It's wonderful, isn't it? This is a lot like the Museum of Science in Boston, only this, is, in a way, is a lot better. The exhibits are out here, outside. Um, it's just a tremendous achievement. Uh, and, it's, and every day there are classes, there are school groups coming from the slums down the mountains on the cable cars uh, to visit this museum of science. And it's a fantastic experience. This is a different library park. So they, they built this beautiful library park. It cost $300, $300 million to build the tram and the library park. Uh, and you'd think that's enough, right? That's pretty good, right? They built five of them. In four years, they built five library parks. This is the second one they built. Uh, there's no wall separating the neighborhood from the library park. This is their, this is their living room. They own this. So their children just come over here. It's safe and welcoming, and this is theirs. Um, so pretty good, right? Well, that's not all they did. They built uh, 72 new schools from scratch. They built 72 new schools. And where did they build them? They built them in the poorest neighborhoods in Medellin. Pretty good, right? Yeah. Well, that's not all they did. <laughs> They renovated close to 200 schools. They renovated 200 exist, close to 200 existing schools. And they increased the salaries for teachers. And they uh, just made it easier. They figured out what it would take to keep the kids in school and to increase the quality of the school. And they, they did it. And the, the main thing that was motivating them was to be convincing. They had four years to convince the people of Medellin that they weren't kidding. Uh, you can tell people that this is what is going to happen, but uh, after generation and gen after generation of broken promises, it takes more than than more talk. You have to demonstrate that you're serious. And because they simply made a commitment to stop stealing the money, they suddenly were flooded with. They had all the money they needed. And now their problem was time. But they also knew that if they did this, if they rushed this and they built stuff without talking to the community, they knew that it would backfire. Mm -hmm. So they, they identified the steps they needed to take, and they didn't skip a step. They did everything they needed to do, even if it delayed the project, because they knew there was no option. And by the end, uh, now every mayor who comes after has to do at least this well. So uh, if I feel sorry for the next mayor, because you know, how do you top this? You can't. You can't just. You got to at least keep this going. But in order to really put your people in power and hold power, you got to do better than this. So um, good luck with that. So. Um, and I'll, I'll stop here. This is, this, she's smiling not because her house is better. She's smiling because her life has been completely transformed. Not her house, her life. And her house is the same house. But her life is unrecognizable because 
everything has changed. So that that's the story of Medellin. You know, the question is, so what? What's the point? Medellin can do this. Singapore did that thing. Bilbao did that thing. How does any of this help us uh, anywhere else? Because uh, Boston is not Medellin. Port-au-Prince is not Medellin. You can't do this. But is there something here that we can learn from and do better than we have been doing from the demonstration of, of this? Um, and the last thing I'll say is uh, my students understand that when we, we sit down and we start class, um, they can talk, at least at the beginning of class. But by the second week or third week, they got to show me. I got to see it. I got to see the drawings and the models. I got to see the papers. I got to see the pictures. They have to show me. We play by Missouri rules. Missouri is a state in the United States uh, where this, the motto on the license plate, you might have seen it go by quickly. Missouri is the show me state. Missouri, the people from Missouri are famous. They basically say, don't tell me about it, show me. You know, save your fancy talk for someone who, who will believe you. I'm not going to believe you until you show me. show me. Show me the evidence. And so this is basically the key ingredient in uh, Made in Colombia, is uh, they demonstrated how serious they were. They really did it. They didn't just talk about it. They really did it. So that's the story of Medellin. OK. Questions about this? Is it still in function? Yes. Um, they have term limits. Mayor can only serve for four years. So Sergio Fajardo was mayor from 2004 to 2008. Mm -hmm. Then the next mayor uh, was actually a colleague of Sergio Fajardo's. Uh -huh. And he continued the programs. And uh, they now have seven library parks. Uh, and they're, they're continuing to build more. Uh, and um, Sergio Fajardo was elected to be governor of the province. And so he's trying to extend the successes of this to other cities of Colombia. Uh, and so this is the hot new thing. In a way, this is, if you put together uh, Curitiba, uh, Bogota, Rio de Janeiro and Medellin, the story that is coming out of here for the rest of the world is there's something happening in those Latin American cities where they're figuring out new approaches and new ways of doing things that all of a sudden it seems possible. Uh, architecture is not enough alone. Planning, not enough. Transportation system, not enough. Housing, not even close to being enough. Uh, it has to be an integrated thing. And it's not surprising that we uh, aren't able, weren't able to do very much in the 20th century. Because in the 20th century, uh, everyone has to specialize. And uh, no more, the, the place this happens the most is in engineering schools, right? Did, did you all go to engineering school? Yeah. Me too. So the first thing they asked me was, OK, you want to be an engineer, but, but, but uh, what kind of engineer do you want to be? And I said, I don't know. I'm a freshman. Uh, that, 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 that. you got to commit. Do you want to be an electrical engineer, a mechanical engineer, a civil engineer, a op systems operation engineer? Uh, which do you want to be? You have to choose. And I was like, uh, and I, you know, so I would choose one. And I would go to my classes, and I'd say, oh, that's very interesting. Isn't, isn't that similar to what happens in mechanical engineering? And they said, you know what they would say? That, 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 that's mechanical engineering. <laughs> Come back. We're not studying mechanical engineering. And so um, the biggest one that's been featured in this discussion is transportation engineering. And uh, it used to be that there were a lot of people involved in designing the city. And then architects got more specialized, and planners took over the design of the city. But then planners kind of got into public policy. And the only ones left to design the city were transportation engineers, mostly road engineers. And so 
we specialized into tiny little segments. We solved the problem of transportation because we are experts and we know how to solve the problem of transportation. We solved the problem of housing because we know how to solve the problem of housing and water and sanitation and education. Everybody has their own little slice of the pie. But when you solve the problem of transportation in a very specific way, it causes other problems that are outside your scope of expertise. And so it's not surprising that by looking at and solving a problem in a very narrow way, there'll be all kinds of unexpected problems that pop up elsewhere. So it turns out here we are in the 21st century. The biggest problems we face in the 21st century are because the solutions of the 20th century were so good. They were so effective. It worked so well, but in a very narrowly conceived way, that it caused all the other problems. And so we can't afford to solve the 21st century problems in a narrow way. We need to work together in multidisciplinary teams, as they did in Medellin. It's the military, then it's the teachers, then it's the social policy, then it's the transportation infrastructure. And the housing people have to kind of be able to step back and let the, the public parks and the libraries and all these other things to take priority. Uh, and so it's a very, there's a lot of moving parts, and no one is going to solve the problem on their own. It's only going to be solved with a larger vision that integrates a lot of different things, including the people who are going to own this, who do own it and are going to own it. She doesn't have a land title, but that doesn't mean she doesn't own this. She owns it in a much more profound sense, that she is the key to success and failure, and you have to get your head into her head to figure out what's going to make her life and the life of her children better. And you can't do that by just looking at things as a technical problem. It takes a much more complex and interesting uh, approach. So that's the story of Medellin. Okay.